Hi, welcome to lesson one, part two. How does the text communicate its message? So in the last video, I talked about the question, what message is the text communicating and how to develop a solid argument that is debatable and complex and specific. Once you have an argument or as you are trying to prove your argument, the way to do that, the way that we prove our argument is through thinking about narrative component. We consider all of the components of the text, but narrative components, things like character, plot, like literary language, especially when we're talking about literary text. If we're thinking about a visual text, a text that um, maybe a film or a television show or an illustrated children's book, I think maybe then things about like the angle of the camera. We think about the framing. We think about the colors used. We think about all of the elements of what's on screen or what's on camera, depending on the situation or what's on the page. And these components help us make decisions about what we th think the text is communicating. And then they help us to demonstrate how we think the text is communicating that message. In literary studies, this is a process called close reading, and we're gonna work a little bit more on close reading next week, but we're gonna start it today. I'm gonna take a look at some visual components as well as some narrative components. So if we take a look at this picture, the first thing you notice is the color, right, for me, and I'm gonna be speaking as, as me, you may, hear something different or see something different as you take a look at it. But I noticed the color, the colors are dark, they're grim. There's a lot of this gray color. It's not really super distinguished from the blue color there. This pale lavender color is kind of, for me, a little spooky, especially when it's combined with this sort of drab brown and this sickly green. So for me, all of these, this color palette is making me feel depressed and sickly and sort of not happy. Also this, for me, visually, this looks dilapidated. This is barely being held up properly. This ladder is, seems sketchy. It just, everything is sort of old and crickety and looks like it might fall over. You have this poor cactus that it does not look like a happy cactus. It's drooping. Drooping cactus means it's sad or it's not getting enough water or maybe sun given the look of things. And he has this rickety bucket. So all of those things for me are signifying a place that's sad, that's pitiful. If we move to the next page, we see some of the text, the language, the words that are being used. So on the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. So what's interesting here in terms of the language for me is we see three rhymes, pale, nail, snail. So that connects all of it together. It also you know, keeps it a little bit of lightness to the situation even though we're in this sort of grim space, the rhyming makes me feel like, oh, okay, okay, maybe we'll be all right. And then, so on the end of a rope with a tin pail, that to me suggests it's a pretty lo-fi, low-fashioned um, way of, of doing things. He doesn't, and, and it allows him to stay up there by himself, right? So he doesn't want anyone to see him. So he uses a system of letting down the tin pail. And then you toss in 15 cents, which isn't really enough for anything. A nail and the shell of a grandfather's nail. So the implication is you're not really giving him anything important. So maybe that's just an excuse. He really wants to tell his story. This is kind of how I read that. And then visually also, these to me appear to be dead. They don't have any leaves on them. Maybe it's winter, but this generates for me a feeling of desertion and death and not help. Okay, so those are all the details that are helping me understand what this page means, right? It's, it's showing that, that this is a bad situation. And compare this color palette to the palette once we actually get into the story of the one slur. This whole beautiful situation. We still have that same blue color that's carrying through, but this has a, got a lot more purple in it, so it, it ends up being a more saturated color. And this, this reminds us of sun. It's the color of the sky is when the sun is out. And this is more of like a rainy color, and there's actually a giant rain cloud right there. <laughs> so we have pastels, which for me remind me of childhood, the little kids using pastels. We have these little birds flying around, and then the trees are full, which makes me think of life instead of death that we just saw in the previous one. So you can see just from, from here to here, the text sets up a contrast between the horrible after effects of the Wensler's decisions and what the world seems like then versus this beautiful sort of paradise with green grass and beautiful pastel childlike trees and this beautiful white puffy cloud that doesn't seem to be threatening to overwhelm you with rain, which is what the dark purple cloud I think implies is that there's gonna be rain and maybe a storm, which is scary. And then just finish by taking a little bit of a look at the language. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet, and the clouds were still clean, and the song of the Swomi Swans rang out in space.
place. One morning I came to this glorious place. Automatically we have the rhyme, which again, for me, keeps it light and happy. And there's way more rhyme here. And we have like days, green, wet, clean. We have a lot of vowel sounds and it, with the and and the and and the and, it all flows together. It makes me feel happy, right? Way back in the days, the pond and the clouds and the song and one morning it was glorious place. So this is very nostalgic in a lot of ways for me. And then we've got the exclamation point. At first saw the trees, the truffle of trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffle of trees. So we have trees, trees, trees repeated, which emphasizes it. And each time he builds, I saw the trees, the truffle of trees, we're building on that. And then we have alliteration here, T and T, truffle of trees. We like alliteration. We like it when the beginning sounds are the same. Then we have the bright colored, so we're adding bright colored tufts of the truffle of trees. Ah, what a beautiful sequence. First saw the trees, the truffle of trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffle of trees. It just rolls off, rolls off the tongue. All right, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. So this is a much happier, quicker, more sing-songy set of discourse than the one that we saw on the previous page. So that's a little bit about how the text communicates the message. So what I've done for you is I've set up a number of questions that will get you to start thinking about how how the text sets up the message and, and how you can understand it. In literary studies, we often do things the opposite way of the way I've just shown you. I talked about the argument first and then we talked about kind of the evidence, like how does the text do it? But often in literary studies when we're, when the actual process is, is the opposite direction where you first take a look at the text and start to notice its details, start to notice all the little things that, as they add up. Look at this contrast between the dark, you know, stormy looking environment and the, the bright, sunny looking environment. We notice all those details and as we notice those details, they build up into an argument. So you're gonna get a chance to practice this right now.